Patrick Milas, and I am the Continuing Education Consultant here at the Bureau of Library Development. As Continuing Education Consultant, I am your go-to person for any and all questions or concerns you have about continuing education, such as webinars and self-paced courses. Together with the State Library and State Archives, the Bureau is a part of the Division of Library and Information Services, which is part of the Florida Department of State. We are a state agency, and if you work for a Florida library, we work for you. You're attending a Bureau of Library Development webinar, and this webinar is part of the Library and Information Science Foundations for Professional Practice series. In October, I introduced some key aspects of information policy and information organization relevant to Florida libraries. Without further delay, Today I will be focusing on library research methods. Thank you for joining us for this important topic that is so central to studying how libraries operate and how users can leverage the knowledge gained from libraries in person and online. During today's webinar, you're welcome to raise your hand if you would like to ask or respond to a question or make a comment. Melissa will be happy to unmute your microphone so you can verbalize your question or comment. You're also welcome to simply type your question or concern in the chat box that Melissa explained just moments ago. The purpose of library research can be descriptive, exploratory, explanatory, or evaluative, also known as policy-oriented. These categories are not mutually exclusive. They're a matter of emphasis. As any research study will change and develop over time, you may identify more than one purpose. As its name suggests, descriptive research seeks to provide an accurate description of observations of a phenomenon. The object of the collection of census data is to accurately describe basic information about a national population at a particular point in time. The objective of much descriptive research is to map the terrain of a specific phenomenon. A study of this type could start with questions such as, what similarities or contrasts exist between A and B, where A and B are different departments in the same public library, branches of the same regional library, or different types of libraries within Florida. Such descriptive comparisons can produce useful insights and lead to hypothesis formation. But how do you actually go about descriptive research? One useful data collection method is focus groups. Focus groups are forms of group interviews, but there are differences. You will probably be familiar with the term focus group from market research reports, as they are used often to test reactions to new products or new politicians. A focus group usually consists of six to 15 people, or five to 16 people. If the group is too large, then it tends to break up into subgroups and control is difficult. The researcher acts as a facilitator rather than an interviewer. The facilitator starts with a clear theme communicated to the participants and a set agenda of items. The group then works through the items, but the facilitator should also be prepared to pursue novel issues as they arise. Focus groups should be recorded or filmed. Filming can be more difficult and intrusive, but is often worthwhile. Permission of the participants should always be sought for taping or videoing. It is vital to make sure that everybody talks. If you wish to use focus groups across an organization as a primary method of research, then a pilot focus group should be tried first to learn the problems. An, an example would be a detailed set of data on the profile of patrons would be an example of a product of descriptive research. By understanding the patron better, an acquisitions department will be able to take to make better decisions on new collection development. Exploratory research might involve a literature search or conducting focus group interviews. The exploration of new phenomena in this way may help the researchers need for better understanding, may test the feasibility of a more extensive study or determine the best methods to be used in a subsequent study. 
For these reasons, exploratory research is broad in focus and rarely provides definite answers to specific research issues. Since exploratory research aims to identify key issues and variables, it is helpful to ask, to ask around, albeit in a systematic way. For my own dissertation research, I sought to explore the relationship between religious faith and library behavior. Interviewing students, librarians, and faculty at a theology library was instrumental in identifying key issues. Data can be collected by using unstructured and semi-structured interviews or by using structured interviews. When using semi-structured interviews, the researcher may encourage an informal conversation covering certain themes and questions. These questions may vary from one interview to the next, and the order in which these questions are asked may vary also. Semi-structured interviews are primarily used in explanatory research to understand the relationships between variables, perhaps as have been revealed by some prior descriptive research. Additionally, semi-structured interviews are used in exploratory studies to provide further information about the research area. Unstructured interviews, sometimes called in-depth or non-directive interviews, are designed to explore in-depth a general area of research interest. Interviewees are encouraged to talk freely about events, behavior, and beliefs in relation to the research area. Such interviews are used in exploratory research to find out more about a particular event and seek new insights. As for other data collection methods, more than one type of interview might be incorporated in the research design. How about some examples? You could use unstructured interviews to identify variables to be tested in a questionnaire or structured interview. Semi-structured interviews to explore and explain themes identified through a questionnaire. Combining within one interview, one section of factual structured questions and one section of semi-structured questions designed to explore the responses from the first section. Or using semi-structured and unstructured interviews to verify findings from questionnaires. Interviews are useful in the following situations, where there is an exploratory or explanatory element to the research, when you want to know the meanings which respondents ascribe to various phenomena, where it will be important to establish personal contact, where the researcher needs to exercise control over the nature of those who supply data, when there are a large number of questions to be answered, when questions are complex or open-ended, and when the order and logic of questioning may need to be varied. An example from library administration might be an exploratory study of a new management technique in order to brief a team of department heads. This would be a vital first step before deciding whether to embrace the technique. The term explanatory research implies that the research in question is intended to explain rather than simply describe the phenomena studied. Traditionally, the research denoted by the term explanatory has been quantitative in nature and has typically tested prior hypotheses by measuring relationships between variables. The data are analyzed using statistical techniques. In the narrowest sense, this term is sometimes used synonymously with experimental research with the implication that only experiments are capable of answering causal questions. Explanatory research is a solid approach for variables that are easily quantifiable. Quantifying variables when your research subjects are human beings requires particular care on the part of the researcher. The first critical step in data collection with human subjects is informed consent. You need permission to research people. One of the conditions on which informed consent rests is that participants' privacy will be respected. Privacy refers to persons and to their interest in controlling the access of others to themselves, and no participant should ever be forced to reveal information to the researcher that the participant does not wish to reveal. 
Confidentiality is equally important and refers to information about the person that has been revealed to the researcher. Especially in user or patron research, researchers are in a position of responsibility and dealing with a great deal of very personal information that their participants have agreed to disclose. Safeguarding this information is a key part of the relationship of trust and respect that exists between the researcher and the participant. Depending on the type of study, personal identifiers, such as names, reading interests, places of residence, etc., may be collected. In situations where these data are collected, researchers may take several steps to ensure the confidentiality of their participants' information. Researchers can use participant codes to label data instead of using names and keeping a separate list of code to name matchups. In interview studies, use the participant's first name only or even use an alias when recording or publishing data. Most of the time, an alias will suffice and is especially important to protect the participant if the published data includes other identifiers, such as age, gender, community affiliations, or place of residence. Be careful not to publish enough information that the participant can be identified. For my dissertation research, I needed to create a fictitious name as a surrogate for the name of the library where I conducted my data collection. I'd like to take a moment to mention that there is another type of research that aims specifically to address research questions that are not easily quantifiable, called qualitative research. Qualitative methods of data collection focus on all relevant data, whether immediately quantifiable in a standardized scale or not. It is important to note that it is not just non-quantitative research. Qualitative research provides the individual's own accounts of their attitudes, motivations, and behavior. It offers richly descriptive reports of individuals' perceptions, attitudes, beliefs, views, and feelings, the meanings and interpretations given to events and things, as well as their behavior. It displays how these are, are, are put together, more or less coherently and consciously, into frameworks which make sense of their experiences, and illuminates the motivations which connect attitudes and behavior, the discontinuities or even contradictions between attitudes and behavior, or how conflicting attitudes and motivations are resolved in particular choices made. Qualitative data is particularly useful when it comes to defining feelings and attitudes. For example, a library staff attitude survey may be meaningless without some qualitative elements. Evaluation is a set of research methods and associated methodologies with a distinctive purpose. They provide a means to judge actions and activities in terms of values, criteria, and standards. At the same time, evaluation is also a practice that seeks to enhance effectiveness in libraries and policy making. In order to improve, as well as judge, there is a need to explain what happens and would have to be done differently for different outcomes to be achieved. It is in this explanatory mode that evaluation overlaps most directly with mainstream social science. So how about an example of evaluative research? Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act requires that federal e-government websites be accessible to persons with disabilities. These accessibility standards were designed to ensure that e-government websites, one, provide equal or equivalent access to all users, and two, work compatibly with assistive technologies. To take an evaluative research approach to examine the accessibility of e-government websites in terms of the Section 508 standards would address the complexities of accessibility and the reasons for continued inaccessibility on e-government sites. The methods could include, it could include a law and policy analysis of the standards of Section 508, user testing involving persons with disabilities interacting with e-government websites, expert testing of e-government websites, 
testing of e-government websites with automated testing software, and or a survey of federal web developers regarding their perceptions about accessibility. I use the expression and or because evaluation research lends itself to using multiple methods. Evaluation research could well have components that are initially exploratory and become descriptive and explanatory. So as I mentioned earlier, these methods are not mutually exclusive. Cross-sectional research is a one-shot approach. Cross-sectional studies are those in which data is gathered once, during a period of days, weeks, or months. Many cross-sectional studies are exploratory or descriptive in purpose. They are designed to look at how things are now without any sense of whether there is a history or trend at work. Research carried out longitudinally involves data collection at multiple points in time. Longitudinal studies may take the form of a trend study, which looks at population characteristics over time, for example, organizational absenteeism rates during the course of a year. A cohort study that traces a subpopulation over time, for example, absenteeism rates for the Bureau of Library Development Consultants or a panel study that traces the same sample over time. For example, graduate career tracks over the period 1990 to 2000 for the same starting cohort. While longitudinal studies will often be more time consuming and expensive than cross-sectional studies, they are more likely to identify causal relationships between variables. Library and Information Studies, LIS, is categorized as a social science. Other social sciences include psychology, sociology, political science, and economics. All of the social sciences, including library science, look to the American Psychological Association, or APA, for guidance on how to properly report on original research and cite existing research. The APA publishes a manual of style periodically as new sources, new sources such as e-resources and blogs begin to be cited in mainstream research literature. Another important aspect of belonging to the social science research domain is library research's emphasis on reliability and validity. Reliability refers to the repeatability of findings. If the study were to be done a second time, would it yield the same results? If so, the data are reliable. If more than one person is observing behavior or some event, all observers should agree on what is being recorded in order to claim that the data are reliable. Reliability also applies to individual measures. When people take a vocabulary test two times, their scores on the two occasions should be very similar. If so, the test can then be described as reliable. To be reliable, an inventory measuring self-esteem should give the same result if given twice to the same person within a short period of time. IQ tests should not give different results over time, as intelligence is arguably a stable characteristic. Validity refers to the credibility or believability of the research. Are the findings genuine? Is hand strength a valid measure of intelligence? Almost certainly the answer is no, it is not. Is score on the SAT a valid predictor of GPA during the first year of college? The answer depends on the amount of research support for such a relationship. There are two aspects of validity. Internal validity, the instruments or procedures used in the research measured what they were supposed to measure. For example, as part of a stress experiment, people are shown photos of war atrocities. After the study, they are asked how the pictures made them feel, and they respond that the pictures were very upsetting. In this study, the photos have good internal validity as stress producers. There's also external validity. The results can be generalized beyond the immediate study. In order to have external validity, the claim 
that spaced study or studying in several sessions ahead of time is better than cramming for exams should apply to more than one subject. For example, to math as well as history. It should also apply to people beyond the sample in the study. Different methods vary with regard to these two aspects of validity. Experiments, because they tend to be structured and controlled, are often high on internal validity. However, their strength with regard to structure and control may result in low external validity. The results may be so limited as to prevent generalizing to other situations. In contrast, observational research may have high external validity or generalizability because it has taken place in the real world. However, the presence of so many uncontrolled variables may lead to low internal validity in that we can't be sure which variables are affecting the observed behaviors. So what is the relationship between reliability and validity? If data are valid, they must be reliable. If people receive very different scores on a test every time they take it, the test is not likely to predict anything. However, if a test is reliable, that does not mean that it is valid. For example, we can measure strength of grip very reliably, but that does not make it a valid measure of intelligence or even of mechanical ability. Reliability is a necessary but not sufficient condition for validity. Before we open it up to questions, I'd like to take a moment to review some important resources. The first resource you can see featured is our BLD Continuing Education page. From this page, you can register to join our webinars and view our archive of recorded webinars on our YouTube page. So you can find, review, and share the prior webinars in the Library and Information Science Foundations for Professional Practices series. In October, we held the Introduction to Information Policy in Libraries webinar and the Introduction to Information Organization in Libraries webinar. Check out info.florida.gov bldce for access to our many other webinars. Like the other webinars in this series, this webinar, Introduction to Library Research Methods, was designed for new Florida library staff and volunteers with no prior experience or education in research methods. Therefore, I encourage you to share the recording with any of your new staff or volunteers. The second resource featured here is the American Psychological Association's page. This is a great resource for general guidance with social science research methods and a handy reference for the ever-evolving APA style for in-text and reference citations for research papers, projects, and publications in the domain of library and information science. Finally, Babby's landmark Practice of Social Research is probably in its sixth or seventh edition and remains a sort of gold standard for library science students in North America. As always, you're welcome to send us any questions when you register for a webinar, ask questions verbally or through chat during the webinar, or any time afterwards, certainly. Here at the BLD, we love to hear from you, so please keep your questions and suggestions coming. Does anyone have any questions about uh, uh, today's library research methods content? While you're thinking about that, um, I'd like to say thanks to my colleague, Melissa Hook. The BLD keeps very active on social media. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. The potential for you to connect with your Bureau of Library Development is at hand, and the pathways to do so are right there on your screen. So join our continuous efforts to communicate and collaborate for the benefit of Florida's libraries. Remember that if you work for a Florida library, we work for you. Again, if you'd like to uh, ask a question, you can raise your hand or just type your question into chat 
I would like to thank you very much for engaging in the webinar this afternoon. We would really like to hear from you about how we are doing and what other training needs you have. So I will be sending out a follow-up email after the webinar that includes a link to complete the webinar survey, a PDF of the presentation slides, and a link to the webinar recording on YouTube. Do complete the survey if you can. We certainly value your feedback. We will stay online here for a few more minutes to make sure we answer any questions you may have. But that about covers it for today. Thanks again for joining us this afternoon. It was great seeing some of you last week at the Public Library Directors meeting here in Tallahassee. We look forward to seeing you there again next year. I look forward to seeing you all again in person or online at a future BLD webinar.